to try to be brief here. Uh, we have a timeline that is intact, that makes common sense, and that speaks to the defendant's guilt in this case. The timeline is that the only time that motion is detected in her home, after her phone stops being used, the defendant's right there. And then as he's leaving, he's got her blood on him. That timeline is intact. It is a common sense timeline to convict him. The defense timeline, the defense timeline that they've set forth is completely unreasonable. Their claim is that she was stabbed in her home sometime at around that 120 mark before the motion goes idle. Yet somehow, somehow she just happens to unlock her phone multiple times, fire up Netflix, and watch some Netflix as she's bleeding out there, it makes absolutely no sense. And again, you look at her phone, you look at her phone, there, there's like one splotch of blood. And again, her phone is, is in an area where there's some blood. There's one splotch of blood. That's it. That's all. Don't you think if she had been using this phone multiple times and somehow having the capability to unlock it and use it multiple times after getting stabbed that you'd see more than that one splotch? But that's all there is. And then their theory from there goes even further into the absurd. Their theory then is that not that she dies right there, because they have to explain that motion at 420 right when the defendant happens to be right there. So then their theory is that after getting stabbed eight times, eight times, she collapses. And then she spontaneously rematerializes and reanimates and wakes up three hours later. Three hours later, and she's the one that triggers the motion at 420, and it just happens to be that the defendant is right there. And when he touches her, despite her still being alive, to trigger that motion at 420, despite her still being alive, he says that when he touches her, that her body is cold to the touch. Explain that to me. Explain if she's still alive at 420 to trigger that motion, that her body is cold to the touch immediately thereafter when he touches her. It makes absolutely no sense. And he said that her body is cold to the touch, not because he actually touched her body, at that time because he sat through two different times when Kevin Mole has testified about touching her body and he's simply parroting back to you what he heard from the person who really found her body. That's it. Their timeline is completely absurd. And then all the misdirection in this case about bouncing back and forth between Jeff Herbstman to Aaron Pergament to Brett Foreman to you name it is laid bare. Because Mr. Brown now says Jeff Herbstman knows exactly what he did. He knows exactly what he did, and that's why he said what he said when he was in Kalamazoo. So now we know Jeff Herbstman is the real killer. So now we know all that, all that attention to Aaron Pergament and Brett Foreman was a complete waste of time and a complete distraction. Yet in the very next breath, after saying Jeff Herbstman knows exactly what he did, even in his closing argument, what does he do? He goes right back to Aaron Pergament. What about this? What about that? more distraction. That's all that it is. And he wants to criticize us for putting on evidence about Jeff Herbstman. There's a reason that this case had to be about Jeff Herbstman. We're asking you to do something serious. We're asking you to convict the defendant of first degree murder. That is a serious charge. And you have every right to know, as the people that are charged with that decision, you have every right to know that there was this other guy who convinced himself that he thought that he did. And you have every right to know why it was that he was cleared. And that's exactly what he was. He was cleared. They want to tell you that they want to tell you that somehow he wasn't delusional at the time that he made the statement. You saw his demeanor. You saw his demeanor on that body one camera video. You see, you heard his demeanor on the 911 call and compare that with how he was in court. He was a completely different person. Obviously, he was not in the right frame of mind. And the idea, again, the idea that, that he somehow also got into this delusional, crazed state the day of Samantha Wool's murder, 
but nobody nobody reported that. Nobody flagged that. Nobody came forward and said Jeff was acting weird. Something's wrong with Jeff. It's because it never happened. And then there's this theory that, again, Jeff Herbstman premeditates this murder. Premeditates this murder for reasons we don't know because the testimony we heard was that she was the last one that wanted to get back together with him. So he has no motive to kill her. But he decides he's going to premeditate this murder to the point that he leaves his phone at home to leave no trace, make sure law enforcement can't track him. And he drives his, he rides his bicycle over there, apparently. That's the smoking gun, is the bicycle. But the video that they say is now Jeff Herbstman on video at 120, he's getting out of a car. So what's with that? Again, there's no, there's no explanation, there's no rhyme or reason to their arguments. And then despite his premeditation, he doesn't even finish her off. He, he allows her to survive, allows her to stumble outside after waking up three hours later. That's their theory, and their theory is nonsense. And it's somehow wrong. It's wrong for Jeff Herbstman to talk to a lawyer after he's brought in for police questioning the day of the funeral. It's wrong for him to do that, but it's okay for the defendant to have a lawyer after his first interview. It's wrong for... It's wrong for Jeff Herbstman to talk to his lawyer about the testimony that he was going to give in this case to prepare for testimony. And you think the defendant wasn't prepared to testify in this case? Again, it's hypocrisy. It's complete hypocrisy. It's somehow impermissible for Jeff Herbstman to have pictures of his ex-girlfriend who was slain, who was stabbed to death. It's impermissible to have pictures of her in his home as he's grieving her. Yeah, there's no pictures in Samantha Wool's home of him because she wasn't grieving his sudden murder. He was grieving her sudden murder. There's nothing abnormal about him having some pictures out as he's going through that process. And they want to talk about immunity. Again, there's a reason that we have use immunity. He made a statement that tends to incriminate it, right? He said, I, I think I did it. I, I convinced myself I did it. I can't force somebody to sit in that chair and say, yep, that's me up there making that incriminating statement. So he gets use immunity. But he said absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing up here when he testified and was subject to ruthless cross-examination for hours. He said nothing that incriminated him because he was cleared and because he didn't do this. They want to talk about the fact that his knives, Jeff Herbstman's knives and the fibers that were recovered from those knives weren't set for, sent away for analysis to the trace unit. They, they were processed for biology. They were processed by the body fluid identification analysts that you heard from uh, toward the beginning of the trial, but they weren't sent along to the trace unit. And this is the oldest trick in the book. Let's point out that wasn't tested, that wasn't tested, that wasn't tested, that wasn't tested. They wanted it tested. They could have asked for it to be tested. But all they wanted to do was try to score some cheap points at trial. That's it. They talked about the scene. And again, this exposes, this exposes them overplaying the hand that they were dealt in this case. Now, Mr. Brown wants to tell you that based on that fruit bowl being overturned in the dining room, that he knows, he knows that's where the that's where the confrontation started, is right there, that fruit bowl. That's conclusive evidence of that. No, it's not. That could have easily just been tipped over as somebody's running out. It could have been there for things totally unrelated to this. We have no idea. It's speculation. He wants to tell you for sure that the only way you could have stabbed somebody like this is to, to pin her down and, and stand over her, and that this is a crime of passion. It's just as easy that the first stab was to the neck, and as she's turning, the next stabs are here, and as she fully turns around, the final stabs are to the back of her head. Again, it's, it's speculation. We can't tell you exactly what happened in there, and you don't frankly need to know that to be able to convict this defendant of murder. He wants to tell you now that James Grafune, the neighbor who testified that he heard something at around that 122, 124 mark, he says in his closing that James Grafune said, 
that he heard, and, and I think this is a quote, don't stab me, don't kill me. That's not his, that's, that wasn't his testimony. That's not at all what he said. He said he, he thought he heard what, what sounded like, like some sort of voice that said, don't blank, don't blank. He said that when he came out the next day and heard the, the picketers at Greektown, that it sounded similar. And if you look at their exhibit that they introduced, which was the, the full <laughs> video of his original statement that he made to the police, So, what's really the morning for me? It's just going to be shot. Mm -hmm. No, I got a warning that, that I do. My immediate thought was that it was at the Capitol complex. That there was something, yeah, that, there was something that, that was repeated. repeated, same phrase repeated, and it was amplified. The yeah. ultimate was an amplified voice, a repeated amplified voice. He didn't say anything about this being a violent voice, didn't say anything about this being Samantha Wool being murdered. And then when he's later in the car, again, in this video, this is what he says. She was killed, but like, um, if if she was killed much later, then I just heard the strike to murder her, and I'm, I'm, I'm wasting your time. So I don't want to have that happen. If she was killed much later, then I just heard the striking workers, and I'm just wasting your time. And she was killed much later. She was killed at 420, when the defendant was right there. Now. When this is the, the defendant's smoking gun that they have, apparently, and I'd like to know where that image that they showed you came from, because if you look at this person running video, and you'll have an opportunity to scrutinize this video on the a computer when you go back, this is, about as, this is about as much of an image I could get. You see a blob. Can't tell anything from that. This is Jeff Herbstman, they want you to believe. You know, if you're going to stand up in court and make serious accusations about somebody, accuse that person of murder, you should have serious evidence to back it up. And I'm not saying at all in any way, shape, or form that they have any burden in this case. They don't. But I'm just saying that we are accusing the defendant of murder, and we backed it up with serious evidence, evidence that you saw on full display over the last month. This is not serious evidence. The accusations they've met, made against Jeff Herxman are unsupported. They're unremarkable. Now, they want to talk about this pillow that uh, was sent away to be analyzed for a shoe impression, a footprint impression. It's sitting, literally surrounded, by the victim's two sandals that are bloody. And I'm not in any way suggesting that this pillow came back as having Michael Jackson Bolanos' footprints on it. It didn't. But to say that, oh, the real killer's, the real killer's footprint is here. The real killer's footprint is on this pillow that just happens to be right next to Samantha Wool's shoes. But... The real killer's footprints aren't in all the other blood that's at the crime scene. It's another distraction. And then, you know, when we talk about the defendant and this idea that his intent, his intent in going through that front door was to take something. Again, the defense continues to circle back on nothing was taken, nothing was taken, so therefore... This wasn't, this wasn't a, a home invasion. This wasn't a, an attempted larceny. Once what happened inside that home happened, he had every reason not to take something. You think he's going to want to get caught with a murder victim's laptop or a murder victim's wallet or a murder victim's phone? He had every reason to get out of there quickly, which is exactly what all of the evidence suggests that he did. They keep saying that it's somehow unfair that we don't have the defendant's GPS data. 
That would be a question for him as to why he doesn't have GPS data on his phone from the night of Samantha Wool's murder. But do you need it? Do you need GPS data when he's admitted that the FBI's mapping of his phone was accurate? When we have something better than GPS data, we have scientific proof that he was in direct contact with Samantha Wool in the form of that blood that's on his clothing? You don't need GPS data. It's another distraction. And again, they, they gloss over this idea that when he lied in the interrogation, that's all, that's all Sergeant Ford's fault. Again, he lied about not seeing a body, about not encountering anything abnormal, about not seeing anything that shocked him. He lied nine times about that discrete issue. And that's just putting aside all the other lies, but he lied nine times about that discrete issue before Sergeant Ford said anything about claiming that he knew that his phone crossed the particular threshold. He wants to say that because he injected this idea in the interrogation that, well, I don't own any guns, I don't hold any guns, that, that somehow, somehow he didn't know this was a stabbing death when he was the one that found the victim's body, apparently, when he, by his own admission, heard about this on the news, he wants you to believe he didn't know it was a stabbing death? Another deflection. You know, at the end of the day, there's only two people who can tell you exactly what happened inside of Samantha Wolf's home on October 21st of 2023. Two people and two people alone. You have, in a way, heard both of their voices throughout this trial. One of those voices is the defendant. He is a liar. He has absolutely no credibility, and his lies tell you that he is guilty. The other voice is that of Samantha Wool. And no, she can't get in this witness chair and testify like everyone else you heard from. She can't, because he killed her but you've heard her voice nonetheless because the defense is absolutely right. The blood tells a story. The blood tells the story in this case and it tells the story of the defendant's guilt. Because whereas Samantha Wool can't sit in that chair and testify right now, she still spoke to you throughout this trial and she spoke to you in the only way that she can speak now, through the blood that she spilled on her attacker the blood that he tried to wash away, but persisted, persisted on his clothing for six weeks. And that voice tells you that he is guilty. And now he wants to undo all of the lies, all of the lies that he sat there in those interrogation rooms with ease and told over and over and over. Now he wants to wave a magic wand and undo all of that and say, oh, actually, I just innocently came across this body. That's it. After repeatedly lying about that. You know, I heard a word a lot through the defense closing argument. Possibilities. Possible this. This is possible. That's possible. This could have happened. That could have happened. And... I talked about this during jury selection. This idea, and you're going to hear this again in the instructions that you get, that when it comes to the burden of proof, proof beyond a reasonable doubt, there is a difference between a reasonable doubt, a doubt based on common sense, and a doubt based on a mere possibility of innocence. We do not acquit people based on mere possibilities of innocence. In the same way, as I said in my example during jury selection, that if you had a lotto ticket and the numbers haven't been called yet, you're not going to quit your job based on the mere possibility that you're going to get richer when those numbers are called. This idea that he comes up with for trial, this theory that Samantha Wool was stabbed and somehow was able to log into Netflix, that she passed out for three hours from these severe wounds to her neck, and then just was able to get up and walk around, just happened to be right at the moment when the defendant was out there, 
and yet her body is cold to the touch, even though she's still alive, this theory is his lotto ticket. Do not cash it for him. Do not cash it for him. He wants to say that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. The only person who was in the wrong place at the wrong time on October 21st of 2023 was Samantha Wool, And she was in her own home. And you should never be at the wrong place at the wrong time when you're in your home. And the reason why she was at the wrong place at the wrong time is because this man was prowling through the night. And he's the one that killed her. Make him answer for it. Thank <clears throat> you.